So hello, we are on air. And um, yeah, welcome all. So this is a webinar organized by uh, the Research Data Management Group of, of Lieber. And we welcome you to another edition of our webinar series. And today we have um, our speaker, Kathleen Gregory from DANS. Uh, she will speak about data discovery and reuse. Uh, but first of all, a little bit of housekeeping. As you can see, you are all muted, but you have the opportunity and please, please use it. You can put your questions, comments uh, during her presentation in the chat, which you'll find on the left hand side. And after we will turn to your comments and questions. And also uh, before um, the webinar started, there was a question on uh, posted on Twitter and we, we received many responses from you and we will of course pick uh, this up as well. So, and let's get started. I hand over to Kathleen now. Uh, everything in place. Okay. Let me see, we can flip to the next slide. So this is me and Rob is later joining us for the discussion. So, and you can see Gre Kathleen here. And the little housekeeping notes and after the webinar, of course, there will be recordings. And um, yeah, we have the slides already on Zenodo and you will see the link in the chat. So let's get started now. Okay, good. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Birgit, and for the invitation to speak. So before I dive into the talk, I would like to start by posing two questions to all of you, just to think about. First, are researchers at your institutions uh, sharing data? And then second, just think about if you know if researchers at your institutions are actually reusing data created by other people. And it's this the second question that I think is trickier to answer, and it's the question that's really underlying my work. So as more and more data are becoming available, and as more and more people are sharing their data, are people actually reusing them? Now, discovering that data is the first step to reuse. So my research right now is really looking at this question of what practices are people engaging in as they search for data, as they discover data, how are they evaluating the data that they find and making sense of it as they decide whether to reuse it or not? And then I also like to think about how these practices of data discovery are related to community and institutional norms and behaviors, how they're related to infrastructures and, and data supplies. So in today's uh, talk, I'm just going to give an overview of some recent research that I've been doing in this area. And then I'll briefly touch on some resources and tips for data discovery. And then we'll end by kind of opening the conversation, like Birgit said, to discuss what you all are doing in this space so that we can learn from each other also. And as you do have questions and comments, please add them to the chat window so that we have something to discuss at the end of the presentation. And I would also really like to hear your voices and opinions about if the findings that I'm presenting are matching what you've also observed and what your own practices are. So uh, before I jump into presenting my findings, I think it's probably important to step back a little bit and situate my work so you know kind of how I'm approaching things. So I draw on two different disciplines in my work. The first is uh, information science, in particular these models and frameworks for how people are going about the process of finding information. So as information professionals, I'm guessing these types of models might not be altogether new for many of you. And this is just a summary picture of many of these models kind of put together in one picture. But they state that basically you have a user or an actor who has a particular information need, and they might be able to recognize that or not. They then go through a process of finding and discovering information, after which it's a process of understanding it and evaluating it before deciding if they'll use the information that they find or if they'll keep searching for information. So this is one of the frameworks that I draw on in my research. The other discipline that I am coming from here is the discipline of science and technology studies, which has many different 
many different subdisciplines, but this discipline highlights, among other things, the diversity of data. Um, and the idea that what data even are, the definition of that lies in the eye of the beholder. So while text, like a field notebook here, or a map, or a journal article may be data to one person in one situation, those same objects would not be seen as being data to a different person in a different situation. Another point here is that data rarely stand alone. In order to make sense of and reuse data, uh, people need associated information or metadata, but they also need um, skills and technologies and resources and analysis tools to be able to process that data and make sense of it and use it as evidence in their own work. And then the third point that I'll highlight here is that it takes a lot of work <laughs> to get data to travel from one situation to another situation where it can be reused. And this is because people have those different ideas about what data are, uh, because data are created in different contexts and then they'll be reused in different contexts so this process of making data travel to new situations or be reused in different situations uh, is not an easy one. All right, so I'll report here or present some findings from two different studies that I've conducted recently that draw on these two different approaches. So the first are some semi-structured interviews that I've conducted with people who are looking for data. And this was across disciplines. And then based on the findings from those interviews, I drew up a larger survey. Um, so I have more responses there, almost yeah, 17,000, 1,700 people. Um, that again is looking at how people are discovering data and what is important to them is they're making sense of it and deciding if they'll reuse it or not. Good, so go to the next slide here. And I'll present my findings kind of along those same lines as that nice image that we saw from the information retrieval models. First, I'll talk about users and their needs and then their search strategies and then evaluation behaviors. So in the interviews, the first thing I found was that there is a great diversity, even within a single discipline of what people are doing in order to find data and how they're making sense of it. So it's really not enough to think of a user as uh, a researcher in a particular discipline with a fixed set of practices. Even within a single discipline, there are many different ideas about data ownership, about data sharing, about what data even are, and also, of course, other cultural differences that are taking um, coming into play within that broader disciplinary community. Also interesting here, I found that the person who's actually looking for data is not always the person who's using the data. So there were experienced researchers who I spoke with who were training graduate students to look for data for the researcher, um, primarily by searching the literature. Or I also spoke with an information manager working at a company who was finding data for other employees, again, by searching the literature. When it comes to the type of data that people need, um, it's not always what might be typically thought of as research data. So again, in the interviews, the people who I spoke with, they were looking for server logs, for example, or specifications about medical devices. Um, some of them were just interested in metadata. They were just using the metadata about data as their work, as their uh, data. <laughs> Other people were looking for social media posts, so they considered posts on Twitter to be data that they were actually searching for. Um, and these types of data may not be typically what we think about as research data, but they are data that are used in research. Uh, people were also searching for data for different purposes, to be reused in different ways. And some of these purposes were more purposes that support research, such as calibrating instruments, or verifying their own data, but some of them also were uh, serving a different role. So data were acting almost as a center for collaboration, where people were um, seeking out new collaborations with other people in order to get data, um, or decided to get data from a particular person in order to widen their personal network. So these types of um, details emerge from interviews but not necessarily from a survey, but a survey can give us a good overall feeling of the landscape also. 
So I asked participants in, in this follow-up survey, which of these categories uh, best describes the type of data that they would need? And by secondary data, I meant data they don't create themselves. Now people could uh, select multiple responses to this. And the percentages here on this plot are percents uh, for the of the responses to this question. So here we can see that for my sample of survey participants, the observational and empirical data was the most often selected category that people were looking for. And when it came to the reasons for why people were looking for data, so the reuse that they were imagining for the data that they were looking for, the most often selected category here was to use that data as the basis for a new study. And this I found to be interesting because much of the literature um, in data reuse documents that people are looking for data or using data for more of these uh, supportive or background types of purposes like calibration or verification. Um, so here I found it very interesting that the most often selected category was actually to use for the basis of a new study. There are also some other categories here that I'll just point out that I thought were interesting. Um, for example, preparing for a new project or a new proposal, or I guess these are all kind of new categories because <laughs> they have this word new in them, or experimenting with new methods or techniques. So this was something that came out in the interviews also. Uh, people I spoke with were searching for data so that they could learn how to, for example, do data visualizations. Or people were searching for data within their discipline so that they could experiment with using data science as a new type of technique um, in their own research. So when it comes to how people are looking for data and how they're searching for it, they're doing a lot of different things and visiting a lot of different places, kind of picking and choosing from sources and strategies um, as they go along to find the data that they need. And this I found in the interviews, but I also saw this in the survey. So when I asked people what sources, and this was again the, the researchers in the survey, um, what sources they're going to to look for data, there are many different sources that people are using. But I think what pops out uh, to me in this, in this plot is the key role that literature is playing in this process of, of data discovery and data search with three quarters of the respondents saying that they often are using literature in order to search for data. Now, people are also using search engines and that was general search engines with the example of Google. Um, and this I saw in the interviews also that people were Googling for data, but with mixed, with, which is no surprise to us, but with mixed degrees of, of success. And people were also Googling for um, particular domain repositories or looking for the names of particular government agencies that might have data. So not just that they were Googling for data sets or data in particular, but looking for those domain repositories. It might be also interesting to draw out here for this talk, uh, the role of support professionals. So that's abbreviated, the third one from the bottom. Um, and included here was, um, were professionals in information professionals, data managers, or librarians, I think was the examples I gave for this role of support professionals. And not as many people are often, uh, turning to these support professionals for finding data, for assistance finding data, but some people are occasionally doing that. All right, then here we go. I was really curious about the people who are using literature to find data um, and thinking about where those overlaps might be. So I asked all of the people who had responded yes, or often or occasionally to that previous question for using literature, what exactly they were doing with, <laughs> with the literature. And here I found that there were overlaps with how people are searching for literature in general, and that they're following citations from the literature to data, which is interesting given the unstandardized state of data citation in many disciplines. So I think it would be really interesting as, as a follow-up step to kind of break this down a little bit more and see which disciplines and specifically in, in this survey are actually having that practice. But again, I haven't done that yet. This is just at a very broad level for all participants. 
The other thing I was curious about when it comes to using the literature is I thought that maybe people were finding data just serendipitously, like while they were reading an article or while they were looking for an article, they would just find data. And while that did happen, that's the, the third option down here, more people were actually going to the literature and searching there with the purpose of looking for data. I thought that was just an interesting finding that I wasn't quite expecting. Um, another theme that came out of in this area of search and discovery strategies, and this came out particularly in the interviews, but it was also present in the survey, was the importance of social interactions in this process of discovering data. So what you see on your screen here are two quotes um, from the interviews. The first one is a quote from a psychologist who was looking for big data sets. And then the second one is a quote from a paleontologist who was looking for, for smaller data. And for both of these people, the human network or the personal network was extremely important. It was their key source for finding the data that they needed. And this role of social interactions continues to be important when we move on to thinking about how people are evaluating the data they find and how they're making sense of the data that they find. And this is another quote from the interviews from an ecologist, and I'll actually read this out loud because I think it just says it all. Uh, she said, I think if there were a good search engine then I could get the data set directly, I would still get in touch with a data author anyway, both for social reasons and also because most of the times the metadata are not enough to really understand the biology behind the species. And for this particular researcher, she was wanting to contact the actual author to understand what was happening with the data. But other people were talking about how they would contact their colleagues or their personal networks to help them understand data more. So again, using that personal network of, of people to really make sense of, of data before they could reuse it. So in a survey, um, I was curious if this would also come out in the survey because thinking that might not be reported as often. And, and while it was reported, so it's down here toward the bottom, 50% of people said that consulting personal networks was extremely important or important um, in making sense of the data. Other things floated to the top. So again, consulting associated articles was very important. Um, of course, that assumes that there are articles that are actually associated with data to consult. Uh, and also engaging in exploratory data analysis. So doing kind of basic statistical checks on the data or actually having the ability to play with the data a little bit to get a feel for it and really wrap their heads around, around the data was another strategy that was, that was often mentioned as being important. And that was my very brief overview of, of those um, aspects of, of the research, but I thought it would be very interesting for this group to kind of pull out uh, what the librarians and information professionals in the survey group are doing. So in addition to the other questions that I asked, I also asked uh, the support professionals here these two questions. And we saw that most people are supporting researchers um, or students. And when I asked them, propose these categories for seeing how they're actually supporting people with their needs, it's kind of spread evenly across, across these categories with people teaching people about data discovery and evaluation, but also people helping with data curation and data management, and a slightly lower number of people who said they're actually finding data for others. And this is similar to the question that we proposed uh, or that we posed to you all in the Twitter feed and via email. And a lot of your responses also mirrored these responses, although there were some other differences, but I'll, I'll get to those at, at the end when our question session. Um, but given, given this, and given the fact that you all are also teaching people about data discovery, I thought it would be interesting to kind of move to this next bit of some discovery tips or some resources that might be helpful for you. And of course, I'm sure that many of you also have your own resources that you turn to all the time for helping people to discover data or for discovering data yourself. So again, if you'd like to share those with the group, feel free to do that in the chat box. Um, and maybe we can collect those and share them in some way also at the end so we can learn from them. 
But this publication uh, was the result of the work of the Data Discovery Interest Group of the Research Data Alliance. And it was published in PLOS Computational Biology's Quick Tips series. It's a very practical list of things to help researchers with searching for data. So a small group of us got together and we just wanted to, to make something very practical and usable for, for the researcher. And a lot of these tips as you're looking through them, hopefully you're thinking, well, these are kind of good tips for searching for anything, whether it's literature or on the web. And that's true, a lot of them mirror good practice in general. But there are a couple of, of individualities here that I'll, I'll highlight quickly. So um, we'll start with talking about the second tip. So as you know, data are distributed. They're stored in many different repositories. And that makes it really challenging, especially for a researcher to, to think about knowing where to begin searching for data. So you may wish to start, for example, by pointing them to directories of data repositories. And this is something that was mentioned in the Twitter feed also. So such as re3data.org or fairsharing.org. But on those lists of repositories, it can be difficult for a researcher who really doesn't know what the, all of these repositories are to establish trustworthiness in the repository. Um, and that's where efforts such as the core trust seal certification, for example, come in, or tools such as, I forget which library I, website I saw this on, but someone in the Twitter feed posted a, um, a checklist to help researchers determine you know, the, the trustworthiness of a repository. So if that person is here in the webinar, maybe you could post the link in the chat box to that also. But also speaking with colleagues is a very important source to determine which repositories are kind of the go-to sources uh, for a particular discipline. And once you're in those repositories, those domain repositories, those are built for a particular type of data. So often the search capabilities are much more specific than what you get at a more general data repository. For example, they might have maps for searching geographic data or um, a possibility to search by genetic sequence if you're in a database from the NCBI, from the National Center for Biotechnology Information, for example. But I also think that while it's important to make people aware of these repositories, I also think it's important to understand what they're currently doing and understand their practices and kind of meet them where they are. So if they are using the literature to find data, how can we help them to set up uh, literature monitoring search alerts that would be delivering recent news about publications, for example, um, that might have the data that they're interested in? All right, and then the next bit kind of is related to this domain repositories. As many of you know, repository developers and managers spend a lot of time organizing the data and using controlled vocabularies to organize that data. And sometimes the best way to find data is not necessarily with a search, but rather through, through browsing these categories. So really taking the time to uh, familiarize oneself with the controlled vocabularies that are used and the different filtering options can be an effective way to find data. The next one that I'll, I'll just point out here is of course, good practice for every search as, as we know as librarians, right? But given the, the changing nature of data and the dynamic nature of data where you can have data being updated at a relatively quick period of time or different versions of data being made available, it's important for researchers to go back and make sure their data is up to date for using it. So using a DOI or a, pers a persistent identifier to keep track of where you found the data can be a, a quick way to go back and make sure that everything is up to date before it's actually used. Then the next, next tip here. So some data, and this is particularly for, I'm thinking of climate projection data or data from Google Earth, but this type of data is not necessarily available with a search engine. It's available through a service like an application um, programming interface, an API. And if people are needing that type of data, they won't be able just to search for it on Google. They'll actually need to know the services that, that they need to get that through an API. And some of these, these services are listed in data catalogs, such as RE3 data or such as data, data one, um, but they need to be able to know that in order to effectively access that type of data. 
I think I have one more tip here that I'll just kind of call out. Because when we're talking about da discovering data, this gives us a chance to think about possible access restrictions that, that might exist for um, sensitive data or data with privacy concerns. So data such as, of course, health data or data about endangered species or about archeological finds. Um, this data may be discoverable because it may have a data description record or a metadata record, but then only certain people can access it or maybe no one can access them. So that provides an opportunity to think about um, how to best handle that type of data. And also it could provide an opportunity for collaboration. Researchers could potentially contact the data author of that data and discuss more exactly what the sensitive issues are and that could potentially lead to a future collaboration or not, but potentially. And I guess I'll mention this last point too, even though I don't have a, it bolded in particular, because this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, that discovering data and reusing data depends on having a supply of data to discover and to reuse. And so this gives us also an opportunity to encourage researchers to share their data so that other people can, can find it and reuse it. Um, and also to stress the importance of citation of data that they do use, not only to give credit to the researcher who created the data, but also to help facilitate discovery, um, especially through the literature, as we saw that that's something that is, that is being done. All right, I think I will call out one more resource here before we open for questions. And this is a resource that those of you who work with the social sciences are probably aware of. Uh, SESTA is a social science data archive here in Europe, and they have created this lovely data management expert guide, which is a series of tutorials uh, for all different steps of um, data, the data management process. But they recently published their last chapter here on data discovery. And this chapter draws on some of the things we've talked about here in the webinar, but it also um, has unique sources for particular research questions that are often used or addressed in the social sciences. And it has these nice case studies or vignettes, these little stories that are peppered throughout the tutorial that really give the researcher um, a hands-on feeling or a real world feeling for the type of issues that people who are searching for data encounter. So the link is there. And actually there, someone at Dance was just telling me uh, the other day that there is a train the trainer um, workshop coming up specifically for this data discovery chapter. And I believe that's in May in Athens. So I'll try to find the link and put it in the chat here in, in a little bit, unless someone knows that and they can put it in the chat for me. That would also be good. Um, so I think before we open up for the questions, I'd just like us to remember, although we've been talking about these general tips and these general results from the survey, Practices of data search and reusing data are really situated within disciplinary and research communities, and they are shaped by these other infrastructures and data supplies. So when we think about really understanding what's going on at a deeper level, we also need to keep this bigger picture in mind. So with that, I'll um, open it up for questions. Any questions or thoughts that, that you have for me? Um, but I'll also pose here, this is the question we put on, on Twitter, the first question, to learn more about how you all are supporting researchers in this area. Um, and maybe I think that Birgit and Friedel probably have the exact quotes, but just at a high level, I can say there's a great variety. Some people are doing a lot uh, and have really detailed websites and online tutorials. And other people just, they don't have the need for this type of support at their institutions. Um, yeah, so that variety isn't, isn't altogether surprising either. But I, one comment I did think was interesting was that people are also mentioning data discovery within the context of helping people to deposit their data or within the context of other types of information literacy workshops. So kind of embedding it more in existing, existing work. Okay, so I really will end there now. <laughs> and I'm curious to hear what questions that you all have for me. Thanks, Kathleen, for this presentation. It was a pleasure to listen to. Um, one question that came in um, was from Kirsten, Kirsten Helbig, and I think it's good to, to 
can you say something about the methodology in terms of uh, the coverage of the countries you surveyed and um, um, yeah, well, let's start there. Sure, yeah. So um, I'll start with the interviews and then we'll talk about the survey. So from the interviews, I, I spoke with people really across the globe. Uh, majority were from the Netherlands and the United States, but not it wasn't a, a huge majority. I also spoke with people, for example, in Malaysia, uh, people in different European countries from the UK. So there, there was a geographical spread for the interviews. Um, for the survey, I also had a wide geographical spread. Most people were, I think the highest percentage of people responding were from the United States. And I'll, I'll talk about how I um, recruited those participants also. But uh, the second highest, I believe, was from Italy and then Brazil and then the UK also was up there. Uh, but at a lower level, okay. we had people from Africa also. Yeah, so <laughs> right. long, long question or a long response. Yeah, there was more than one question on, on details on, on the, about the survey. Are mm -hmm. people, um, can people access the survey or maybe already results or um, yeah, so you have to wait until your PhD is published? <laughs> Not until the PhD is published, so that's the good news, yes. but yes. probably <laughs> until the preprint is, is published. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, because I am still working through the data, and I really do want to analyze it at a deeper level, not just at the yeah. higher level, which I presented today. But of course, that will be a preprint, and the data will be shared also when I'm done. Okay. Um, but but the, the question is already accessible for people who want to learn more about uh, what exactly has been asked and... and um, yeah, the well, questionnaire itself, it's not yet shared because it really just closed right. probably, I guess it's been two months, but I haven't done anything okay. with it yet. Right. But it will be, the questionnaire will be available also, um, as well as the coding tree or the analysis bit also. Right, that's mm -hmm. good. Um, well, I see it's good that, that there's already a discussion among attendees in terms of people um, referring to a checklist for search engines that have that they've compiled. Um, let me scroll through the reactions. Um, right. Let's see. Um, yeah, people are basically referencing their own stuff, which is good yeah. for information exchange. Um, well, one of the questions we have prepared is that, um, well, what came up is, for example, the, the need for a good data search engine. Um, well, the, Google has this new initiative for a data set search. Have you, well, what is your opinion on that, for example, and how does it relate mm -hmm. to your survey? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that if I had done the survey about a year from now, when Google <laughs> data set search was a little bit more known, then the results would be significantly different. Because I think people will use it um, to find certain types of data, just like we use Google Scholar in a certain way and use literature um, uh, literature databases in a certain way. I kind of think that that might happen. Um, but if you read the, the paper that recently came out of, about Google Dataset Search by Natasha Noy, um, one of the aims of it is to make more data exposed or discoverable. But I, and I think that that will happen, but I think that other data will also become hidden or obscured as more people are using Google data set search because only data that's marked up with schema.org, for example, um, will be crawled or discoverable with Google data set search. And I think they're still using the same ranking algorithm, if I remember right. Perhaps this is too much information, but I think they're still mm -hmm. using the same ranking algorithm that they use for Google um, to rank the data sets that are returned. So then the question is, are those the data sets that people are really interested in or which data sets will get buried and, and not be used even though we have this new tool? So yeah, I think it'll be interesting to, to think about this and keep this in mind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then in, in general, so what role does social media play, do you think, in the discovery of research data? Yeah. Um, that was Contrast something... to the relevance of literature, you, but you. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question, um, and I didn't really ask. I did not really ask about social media per se in the survey. In the interviews, it came out that some people were using more of 
disciplinary um, like discussion forums, more to say, hello, does anybody have a data set on this? Um, and also using email lists, so disciplinary email lists um, to find out more about data or to discover data that way rather than tweeting about it. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just hasn't come out of, of this work. Mm -hmm. And um, what would be the most striking differences across disciplines in terms of how uh, scholars and researchers um, search for, for, for students? Hmm. So the question is, which disciplinary differences are we finding right. in, in how people are looking for data? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's <laughs> difficult to answer because, of course, it, it depends on many things. It's not just the discipline, but it's also like the infrastructures that are existing for certain types of data. Um, and I think it, I, I'm going to change your question a little bit because I think what is maybe more interesting is one of the commonalities, and that's something that I mentioned, and that's the importance of, of the social, the importance of other people in this process. And that's true even in disciplines such as like astronomy, where you have these giant infrastructures uh, for data. People are still making use of their own personal connections to, to find the data that they want. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll find more of those disciplinary differences at a larger scale when I am able to look at the survey data more breaking it down by discipline. Then I think we can have that answer a little bit more firmly. Yeah. Um, one question that I see in the chat is what type of support is, is out there for data reuse to your experience, to your knowledge? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand the question. So is that for data reuse, which aspect of data reuse? <laughs> which, which no, for example, I can think of, of discussions uh, we have in libraries, whether we yes or no should develop further curation services to, for example, improve the findability of, of data. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think that what you said just there is interesting because really it's it's all very related. When we talk about supporting data reuse, we're also talking about, of course, supporting data findability and accessibility and all of, all of the other letters in FAIR, right? I, I think it's difficult to kind of separate it out like that. So again, I'm, I feel like I'm not really answer, answering that question, but we need to kind of consider it all still as a whole. So these resources that are being shared over here in the chat window about work that's being done on, on data search or data reuse support, um, then those probably fit into that question or answer that question as well as I could. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. that wasn't a very good answer. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Well, um, some people raise more or less principal points, but so what is data? And I think you um, you mentioned that, but a distinction that's often made is between data, information, and knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. How relevant is this distinction from your experience for, for, for data searching and for data using and, mm. um, and yeah, support of scholarly I, I think, practices? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, when I first began my PhD, I was really working heavily from this, these models of information seeking behavior, right? Because this is, this is what I'm interested in is the practice of actually finding the information or finding the data. And I was pretty convinced that um, we might need a new model to describe the process for finding data, because to me, I thought that they were kind of very, very separate with the data and the information and the knowledge kind of building on each other. Uh, but now as I go along, I'm not so sure in light of my own research that the processes are that separate in terms of locating and making sense of these things. Um, there seems to be a, a large degree of overlap with how people are looking for literature and how people are looking for data, for example. Um, and then that begs the question also, and that, I think the second or the slide I had about science and technology studies, Sometimes what could be information for somebody is probably data for somebody else in a different situation. Mm -hmm. So I think the lines are maybe a little bit more muddled than, than that pyramid when we think about it. 
Okay. Um, I just unmuted myself. There's also... <laughs> I, I, okay, um, Birgit, you're next for the question. I, yeah, I, I wondered, I mean, there was one question also in the in the chat. I mean, when it comes to citing data, I mean, you, you know how often in journals these data availability policies. Um, I wonder if you have been in touch or considering to have interviews with publishers or journal editors as well in terms of you know this this citation finding data is is of course one of the main entry routes for discovery so do they check if the data has been cited i mean all these basic questions around publishing yeah. um might be worth investigating <laughs> a little yeah, bit more yeah I, yeah I think that would be great i mean i think for repositories i mean now you have this i mean fairness and trusted repositories yeah. i mean are kind of blurry and at the level of journals still so, I mean. yeah it's true you know I, I haven't had a plan in my research to have those conversations mm -hmm. uh with publishers but mm -hmm. um yeah you're, you're very right that it's it's it is all related right the, the citation and the discovery and the reuse um so yeah that's something to keep in mind yeah and they, they might also monitor what's happening if there are right to data which has been has a relation to their own publications and you know yeah exactly give a clue on <laughs> additional mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly yeah uh yeah then there comes up a question about skills i mean do libraries yeah. Stuff yeah. actually have the skills and understanding to help researchers to uh searching and accessing mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. so i think um in my experience of, of working as a librarian, uh, I always really <laughs> enjoy those conversations with researchers where you actually get to know what, about their own particular needs and then help them help them that way. So I know that librarians are very skilled in having these types of, of reference interviews and learning more about actual needs for, uh, for their researchers. So on that level, I mm -hmm. think that that is an important skill to have to, to start out with, to really understand what it is that people need. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next bit of that question here, do they have to help researchers search for and access data? Um, are there additional areas of skills we could be developing? Uh, again, I think, yes, librarians are quite capable to, to develop those types of skills. It's more just a matter <laughs> of learning the peculiarities of, of searching for data and the um, different sources that exist. And right now there, there really are so, <laughs> so many different sources. Um, so, yes, I think it's definitely possible. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, and that's assessing data. I thought it was accessing data. Oh, yeah. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there are general things, of course, general tips that we can help people with, with assessing data. But again, it comes down to understanding the researcher's need. And the researcher <laughs> will need to be able also to, to take the lead role there in assessing the data for yeah the data purpose. quality question came up as well mm -hmm. um, early on in the in librarians the, I, I don't have to they, they don't do it all all of these um issues about quality and trust in data and deciding if it's right for a particular purpose those are situated mm -hmm. within the research community yeah mm -hmm. and the researcher will also um, be drawing on that type of community i would think in determining mm -hmm. if, if data is data that they can use yeah. yeah. Are you aware, uh, Kathleen, of any projects who are looking at, for example, how to advance um, um, search engine types of functionality that would, for example, take into account whether data is licensed or is available for reuse? Mm. Yeah, not, not that or I sensitive. know of. Yeah, yeah, not, not that I know of, uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And if anyone else knows of, of something that's being done on that front, please. Please add that also to the chat box or say. I mean, a little bit, I mean, in the RDA interest group on data interoperability, I mean, they're not looking into search engines as such, but of course, this is then about like, how do you code machine readably, mm -hmm. uh, the type of information and there are certainly areas which are, are not covered yet in terms of there is, of course, for a creative commons, some way of saying, okay, I have this in machine readable form, but mm -hmm. other types of uses are, yeah, maybe not 
fully. Yeah, yeah the data discovery in terms of visiting yeah. the data, not taking it away, but just um, using it on site. I mean, with text and data mining, you often ha don't have the right to just take the, I mean, take the data, but you have to work in this environment, which is provided and mm -hmm. not sure, might be future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wonder group. also, because uh, I think the, the data discovery interest group at RDA is having a discussion also about schema.org and um, what role encouraging repositories to mark up their, their data with schema.org might, might play in making it more discoverable. And part mm -hmm. of that conversation is developing extensions to the schema.org uh, vocabulary to describe data. So I wonder if maybe there's some extension that could be used also to um, describe this type of data, like sensitive data, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But that's just a thought. I don't know that that's actually being, being looked mm -hmm. at or not yet. Mm -hmm. So. Um, let me see what else came up. Else. Mm -hmm. um, so anything from the... Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. You all happy or <laughs> but an additional question? <laughs> Feel free. Let's see. <laughs> one thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs up yeah. Can, no, when can we read your Oh, what well, is um, Kathleen, did you survey um, pay attention to um, the, the, the concept of the topic of open data? Um, not so much per se. There was a question about challenges for um, searching for data or challenges for reusing data and accessing data was one of the challenges that was mentioned with a reason being behind that the data needed was behind a firewall or a paywall. Mm -hmm. uh, so only kind of indirectly are we talking about open data in this survey in that way. Mm -hmm. And and the questionnaire was mainly asked uh, answered by was that support staff or what what's the sort of distribution uh, between mostly, researchers mostly and researchers mostly researchers mostly researchers okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we had forty seven uh, librarians responding and probably about the same students and then the rest were researchers okay mm -hmm. right That's quite good mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay. good looking forward to your <laughs> more of your <laughs> Results. I'm looking forward to my dissertation being finished too. I see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now, and since okay, you're working yeah. at a at a data archive now and, and coming from a library community, so what? How could these two worlds um, liaise better or better cooperate? So the the archive, yeah. the data archives, and the, and the libraries. What what what's your opinion on that? Well, I guess I didn't know that there was an issue in how they were relating to each other anyway. <laughs> so um, my experience seems to be that there's pretty good outreach at, mm -hmm. uh, at Johns also with the library community. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I would need to know more of the problems before I can propose solutions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. OK, then. I think no, if no further questions. questions. Yeah, no additional burning questions. So, um, yeah, then I think we are at the end and can close the webinar. Right. Thank yeah. you all again for, I mean, thank you, Kathleen and Rob and Friedel, who helped us setting up the webinar. And thank you all for coming Thanks today. Thanks all attendees. I hope, yeah, yeah, I hope yeah. you all enjoyed it. <laughs> and of course, please spread the word um, about the recordings. Uh, Friedel would tweet this very soon and then yeah see you in the next and webinar and let us know if you have any webinar. additional ideas yeah. for webinars yes. suggestions are always welcome so thank you all bye 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 bye, bye, -bye.